all of you guys to the, did you know you're in the CPAD track? CPAD, Software Engineering Process Architectures and Design. So um, it is Software Engineering Processes, Architectures and Design. My name is Nancy Henson. The whole reason that we have these amazing sessions in this room in 16A and 16B is because of this guy here and the LabVIEW champions in the room. LabVIEW champions, raise your hand. They're like, we want some really awesome content written by customers who have struggled and succeeded and we love our marketing and sales sessions, but we want more customer sessions. So they came up with this a couple of years ago. Um, CPAD also affectionately stands for Software Engineering Processes Acronym for Dorks. <laughs> that was a Jim Crane. Anyhow, um, I uh, just wanted to introduce the track and let, uh, let you guys know that these three rooms and then Ballroom B, which is on the other side of Texas, still on this floor, but the other side of Texas, will have continuous integration there on Thursday. This is software engineering, predominantly um, in this room. Frameworks, predominantly in 16A, and modular code and clean code in 16B. So it's going to be a pleasure. I'm going to go. Um, Start with uh, introducing Sumita Ganju. And Sumita is, um, has the title of product owner <coughs> for LabVIEW R&D. And so we call them POs, and it's not probation officer. Um, but she's a major decision maker in the area of software engineering tools for LabVIEW. So she has just um, been fantastic as I've gotten to know her and work with her. She'll be excited to hear your feedback. We have Deb Burke, who I've known for five years. Deb, you are product management for LabVIEW in XG. Okay. We've all kind of changed our titles recently, so I want to make sure I got that correct. Um, Deb Will is fantastic, really sharp, going to share some NXG stuff. We're glad to have her. And I'm introducing Chris Salino. It's actually Chilino um, or Salino, but uh, Chris is actually former NI and he used to run the Champions program. And so welcome to Chris. And so this is great. If you guys saw him during the keynote, he's going to like show you guys some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Take it away. All right. So thanks, everybody. Um, So we're going to be talking about um, how to organize your code on disk uh, with some best practices that I've learned while I was at NI as well as at Sears Logic. Uh, I'm really excited about this stuff. There's lots of really cool conversations. So if you guys have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. We can, we can discuss a lot of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? OK, great. Uh, I like to think of this as more of a bunch of suggestions that I'm going to hand out versus this is the law. So there's all kinds of room to flex and center. Anyways, uh, so recapping the introduction. So uh, I'm showing a LabVIEW champion since 2017. We've got a couple of bit.ly links up here. Uh, Cirrus Framework Architect. So I do a lot of different things at Cirrus. I want to push through this. Um, I was at NI starting in 2005 all the way up through the following 12 years before I transitioned over to Cirrus Logic where I learned a lot of these really important lessons. So. Uh, that having been said, you're already introduced to my two lovely co-presenters. This is great. And then we'll jump right in. So, apparently I like the phrase taking a step back because that's also how I started my keynote presentation and I didn't realize that. Anyway, so taking a step back in this conversation. Software engineering process, I think, is somewhat of a nuanced conversation. Not every piece of software that you write should be given the same amount of software engineering process. So what I'm going to suggest are just two categories of thought on the amount of software engineering that you should give to your software, depending on some characteristics about that software. That having been said, I think that the conversation is a whole lot more nuanced than this. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to suggest two, gap, two categories of software. So short-term code. Some of the characteristics for short-term code is maybe you're going to prototype a concept to prove viability. So you're going to just show it and throw it away. Uh, you're a single developer. You don't have any intention of working with a team. Again, you're going to throw it away after a very short period of time, like maybe a few weeks. Uh, standalone. There's no other code that depends on what you're putting together. There's going to be a single version of it. There's not the 1.0 the 1.1. It's just, again, one and done. Uh, stability is less important. You're going to violate all kinds of so software engineering practices because you're trying to demonstrate a concept. But you're going to use source code control. We'll get to that in just a second. Then, the oversimplified second category is what we'll call it long-term code. So the, the idea behind this is you're going to fully implement an idea and see it through for the long haul. Uh, it's going to enable team-based development. 
I mean, so you're not just doing this by yourself. You have to write code in such a way that other people can understand what you're doing. Uh, it might be used by other codes. So this is reusability, super important. I'm a real fan of reusability. Uh, you're probably going to use it for a long period of time, so that could have versions associated with it, like the 1.0, the 1.1, the 1.2, etc., etc. You'll probably have an associated plan for development. I could talk about that for hours. Um, stability is important because other people are going to be using your code. This is not just you demonstrating an Stability is important because other people are going to be using your code. This is not just you demonstrating an idea. Uh, you're going to hopefully adhere to standard software engineering principles covered in uh, things like SMORES and SOLID. If you've never heard of those, there's lots of presentations on Solomon Lecture. There's one that Dimitri's going to be giving later on, which is super awesome. If you've never heard Dimitri's presentation on Solid, check it out. And then you're going to use source code control. So, what I'm going to say is regardless, it doesn't matter if you're going to take your code and throw it away or not, use source code control. Because there's a high likelihood that you're going to come up with an idea and you're going to demonstrate it maybe using VI scripting or some new UI fanciness, whatever. You want to be able to refer back to it. Uh, so I always, I actually have a directory inside of our source code control provider, which is Perforce. I call Skunkworks. Anybody can take a look in there. Anybody can copy what I have. You're on your own if you do. All right. So it's like shoot, you're, you're on your own. But I want to keep track of maybe some scripting algorithms that I came up with. Clearly, if you're going to be distributing your code uh, over a long period of time, you need to use source code control. That's all I'm going to say about this. If Fabiola was in the room, she would be standing up and saying, oh, who's not using source code control? She's a real proponent of it, and I completely agree with her. All right. So now, uh, I got the chance to give a presentation on modularity. Uh, if you guys haven't seen this, it's in the center of excellence. This presentation is going to pick up where that presentation left off. Okay? If you're unfamiliar with the center of excellence, oh my gosh, you rock your world. There are tons of presentations uh, that teach software engineering best principles like, how do you do modular development? What is a module? Why would you ever do that? So this presentation is going to pick up on the logistics of implementing a code module. I'm, question. Great question. So if you Google Center of Excellence Presentations, you'll find it. I want to say that these presentations themselves will also be distributed. And the, the, the URLs are linked right here. So we've got the whole entire set of presentations, and I don't know, was it 40 or 50 of them, that are amazing. And then we have the actual recorded presentation. So you can see. If you go to ni.com and use the search, Center of Excellence. Right, right. Yes, which is. Surprisingly enough, the search works. Thumbs up for that one. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm really big on why before we get to what and how. Uh, why is this idea of having structured source on disk important? Because any engine, I'm convinced of this, any engineering decision must be driven by a business decision. It's not just technology. You have to be able to equate it to dollars or efficiency. If you can't do that, I'm going to argue that's the wrong engineering decision. So this is the business decisions behind the engineering practice. So a standard module that's going to promote team-based development. There's all kinds of business reasons to do that. Uh, for example, any of your developers on your team, if you've seen one module, and we'll get into that, you've seen them all. So you have this instant familiarity with all of the source, which is really, really helpful. That speeds the efficiency of development. Uh, yeah, every developer knows the general structure of each module and where the API is located. That's kind of important. Where are the classes? Where are the build steps? Where is your testing? So I'm going to suggest an architecture for that. Reproducibility and, efficient, uh, yeah, reproducibility and efficiency through automation. Uh, I want to be able to create a new module from scratch pretty quickly and maybe start from a template. So you just copy and paste a whole bunch of directories versus having to figure out where should I put the members of my class? And I have a whole bunch of VIs that relate to a type diff. Should, should that be two different directors? Answer all of those questions in a standard structure. Uh, right, so efficient creation. And then, oh, stability for your customers uh, through revisioning. So each one of these modules can have a version associated with it. And the reason why this is stable for your customers, imagine you release the 1.0 version of your software. And your customer's like, yep, I like it. Then you release the 1.1 version, and your customers are like, ah, I don't know that I want to move to it. 
Are you going to force me to move to it? Not necessarily. You can stay with the 1.1 version, or if they move, or I'm sorry, the 1.0 version, or if they move to 1.1, they can always go back if they don't like it. So that's part of the stability that this modularized system is going to show you guys. So enough talk about the system, and let's just show the system. Actually, pretty simplistic. It's very straightforward. So the idea is it's going to be a directory structure that has what I'm calling uh, the component name. Forget the component prototype up top. The component name, so this would be something like uh, my ball bearing test suite. Right. And immediately under that is the version number. And then we have some directories for build, exports, and source. And we're going to go through each one of those. I have found that this structure solves tons of problems. Right. Uh, so P.S., the reason why I'm having to read off of this is because I haven't thought about anything beyond the keynote until like 30 minutes ago. So <laughs> please bear with me. <laughs> Literally, those are the only words I was saying for the last day. Uh, right, so at Cirrus, like I said, we use um, a source code control provider that uses the centralized versus distributed model, and there's lots of... Um, Center of Excellence presentations on the different types of source code control. I'm not necessarily going to recommend which of these is most important for your organization. What I'm going to suggest is there are some differences that you should evaluate. So, like I said, Cirrus Logic, we use the centralized source code control provider, and that is Perforce. So centralized means your code actually lives in a repository up in the cloud. I don't care where that cloud is hosted, your IT department's going to do it. As opposed to having local repositories on your machine. So, um, great. So now jumping into the structure. <coughs> Excuse me. So the component name and component version number are going to change for each module. Like I said, you might have a component name, my ball bearing test suite, or my file reuse library. And the component version number is going to change with each version of the component. The build, export, and source, those are static names. So those stay constant. Why is that helpful? Well, imagine that you have 50 of these components and there's a bug in one of them. Well, you've got to figure out where the source is located in that one particular component. I know to go to the source directory instantaneously. Every one of my components has source. And so that's where I know to start looking. Uh, oh, another advantage. Um, this structure stays constant. So if there are VIs uh, inside of build that refer to source, the relative path stays constant. And so we'll talk about the advantages of that during build. Question? Build and export and source all contain VIs. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. It depends on what they're trying to do. We'll talk about what build and source and export actually mean. Yeah. Does that mean that you, when you talk about build, Ah, so that's the branching procedure. When I go about revving code, I take the 1.0 version of our source, branch it, and bring into existence the 1.1 version and stop building or exporting the 1.0 version. It's now frozen. So all development is now in that 1.1 version. The way that, yeah, so I get it. So we're talking about branching versus mainlining. I don't use the mainline model. I typically use the branching model. So I would almost say it's a distinction without a difference. There's some logistical differences between the two. But what I found is they're more or less equivalent. So if I have one main line that I'm just branching from, there's advantages and disadvantages to it. So you never go back into the main. No, so I have one current, and then when I branch off of it, current is now old, and the new branch is current. And so I just stick with the, the branch. So you have a 1.0 and 1.1 older than something. You got it. So we'll get the. OK, so you, you branch after release. That's correct. Absolutely. I branch after release. That way, the, the released thing and the source from which the release was made stay in sync. That's really important. <coughs> Good question. OK, um, when you're choosing your module's name, choose it wisely. 
for a couple of reasons. Um, it, you want to make something that's user friendly for your, your customers. So my ball bearing test suite is probably pretty useful. My Q pointer reference dereferencing system. You have to be a developer to really kind of know what that means. So choose kind of a user friendly name. Also because renaming uh, is hard in source code control and lab view. And if you've ever tried to do that in Perforce before, I'm sure half the people in this room would say amen. So renaming is difficult. Okay, good. I'm pushing through this pretty quick. Uh, again, all code that's specific to this module and all of its versions live under that component name. Now, we get down to the component version number, and that's what's going to be read. I mentioned Clive on the um, keynote stage this morning. This is actually Clive's structure. So I have the 1.7, 1.75, and each one of those directories, if you expand them, you're going to see those three subdirectories. So pretty handy. And again, each one of my modules has this numbering scheme. Uh, question? Yeah, you, so Clive is a component name. Correct. You talked about Making the name. Mm -hmm. What's the more oh, yeah, forget that. Okay. So the idea behind it was I want to spin up a new component from scratch. I take the prototype and instantiate it. That was just the idea. Okay. So yeah, I shouldn't have actually had that in the slide. Yeah. All right. Our first warning. So if you have a version number in your file path, that's going to break relative has if there are other VIs that refer to that VI. I know that was a mouthful what I just said. So as an example, let's imagine on disk you have C app main VI, and it refers to uh, a reuse library, files. Maybe you do some common file operations. And so in files, you would have slash 1.0 and then might open VI. Sure. So that's cool. Well, if you revision the files module from 1.0 to 1.1, the relative path between the caller and the callee changes. Is everybody familiar with why that's going to cause a problem? If not, we can spend just a few moments there. Or I can point you to um, Christina Rogers' fantastic presentation on cross-linking. If you've never studied cross-linking before, this is the way that LabVIEW relates the VIs in a VI high level. So it's important to understand that system. Questions? Cool. How do we solve this problem? Because I want versions. That's really important to me, but it can't appear inside the directory. All right. So in Perforce, which is the source code control provider that I use, there's this idea of a mapping system or a workspace where you say, hey, that spot inside the cloud should live at this spot on disk. So in Perforce, that looks like this. Up at the top would be the, the generic form of a workspace. You'd have your depot location, again, some module's name and version, dot, dot, dot. Maps to whatever your workspace name is, some module location, module name. So there's my example, all company code or files 1.0 maps to the a, a space that has no directory name or version inside of it. Sir? Or, or a space that's called Or a space that's called working. So long as that name never changes. The relative, again, the relative path between a caller and a callee must stay constant, or LabVIEW is going to go looking for your VI. And then if it finds a VI of the same name somewhere else on disk, that's the one that you link against. Which one's it going to find? I don't know. Whichever one the LabVIEW algorithm says to find. That's why cross-linking is such a problem. Using the workspace mapping solves this because I might have the 1.0 version of my files module, but when it gets implanted or mapped down onto my local hard drive, it appears at C files open. There is no version number inside of that path. So the workspace mapping inside of Perforce solves this problem. So you have both okay. you have only in That's correct. That's a really important distinction. I should have pointed that out. The version number is only in Perforce land, not on disk. Okay? Thank you for pointing that out. 
to update against the new version of your software module. So when I go to two point, from 2.2 to 2.3, I change that workspace and now the 2.3 version comes down. Correct, and that means you can't go back and analyze the 2.2 data that you've got sitting there. Ah, so good point. This is not for data. This is for your source code. Right? So I'm not talking about data files. Make sense? It means that you need separate programs So my Thursday session is how to turn your source into these builds and how you can relate modules to each other. Now when you start talking about the versions of configuration files that are read in at runtime, like you guys like you're saying, what happens if say the type depth changes inside of my source? So um, I used to own the DACA system. And I always joke with everybody that all of the really good stuff in the DACA system, all the bugs, somebody else. <laughs> well, all of the Sorry? Oh, traded DACA system. <laughs> now, so uh, all of the data that you guys type in on the UI gets persistent, uh, stored on this. Well, if you upgrade to a new version of DACA Max, I've got to be able to interpret the old version of that data if I add a new control on the front end. So we had a whole entire section of code that would test, try catch. Right, so actually, we would embed in the data structure itself its version. Then we would have compatibility saying, if you're, I'm making this stuff up, if you're version 8.6 upgrading to 9.0, this is your code path. If you're 8.6 to 9.1, this is your code path. So we have, that's a whole long story unto itself. Okay, pressing on. So um, what I have inside of my workspace is for each component, there is a separate workspace that has, again, in the first part of the workspace mapping is where the number appears, but where it gets actually implanted on disk, there is no number. And I know that there's a way to do this in like SVN and um, what's it, like a distributed model. Yep. I just, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll just start out with that. I'm sure <laughs> I know there's a way to do it. So it's a solved problem. I just use Perforce. And this is how you do Perforce. All right. Okay. Yeah, so this would just be pushing the point home. On the left-hand side would be your uh, Perforce view. So this is what your source looks like in the cloud. It's a 3.0 directory. On disk, there is no version. And the way I got rid of that number is by a workspace where the first part of the workspace contains the number, the second part of the workspace does not. That's the takeaway. I'm beating a dead horse with the ground. All right, pressing on. OK, so what is this source directory that you speak of? what you think. This is where all the magic happens. This is where all of your source for your things is, all of your classes and whatever else, all of your BIs, all of your type depths. 
At Sirius Logic, we use the following organization under the source directory. This is just a suggestion. We can do this. We do a lot of object-oriented programming, and I mean <coughs> everything is object-oriented programming. As the architect, if I see something that isn't object-oriented programming, I'm asking lots of questions why. So I've come up with this standard uh, sort of organization for each class. Interestingly enough, this is part of five. We'll just go with that. We'll say, uh, I mentioned lots of hardware abstraction layers on the keynote stage. There's a board hardware abstraction layer that is a class. And immediately under that board, you can see the class here. And oftentimes, I'll actually even have one VI that has all the API VIs inside of it, just so you can see at a glance, what are all the capabilities of this uh, class. You don't have to do that by the stretch. I usually have a directory for something like type defs, if there are such a thing. I have a directory for APIs. These are the things that your other people, your other pieces of software are going to call directly. So let's imagine that you have one module that uses another module. You're going to call the submodules API. Where does that API live? In that directory right there. That's public. All the stuff that is the implementation of the class, all the, the gross details that nobody should ever see, that goes in sub-BIs. So that's where I do a lot of my private stuff. Again, just a suggestion. Right. right, so board is the name of my module in this class. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Board is the name of my class in this module. So I've got my source, yeah, no, sorry. I've got my source directory up at the top. Uh, right. Above source, you would have a version number, and then even above that, you would have a directory called validation resources. One of those validation resources is a board, and it's board, or that class's structure has accessors, APIs, sub-APIs, and type types. The class, the class, a class name. That's correct. Oh, question. So out of curiosity, when you have a slightly more nested class architecture, uh, so if I have, let's say generically I have instrument, then yep. children might be EMM, yep. and children are data are specific implementations, do you do them all at the same level under your classes architecture, or do you start subdividing the classes folder Say instruments, PMS, mm -hmm. or like abstracts versus implementations. Yep. So in short, the question that let me rephrase this back to you, see if you agree. Do I mirror the class hierarchy with a directory structure hierarchy? So if A inherits from B, do I have a directory A and a subdirectory B for those two classes? Or do I keep them flat? Okay. So, sort of. Um, also a sort of like hybrid type architecture. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, so not not pure mirror, but a little bit of depth. My answer for that is I do wild wild west. So sometimes, like depending on how complex this whole entire UML diagram is, if it's super complex and I need the organization, then I'll I'll create top level categories. But if there's like I don't know 20 classes and they don't really fit together, I'll just make it flat because it's easier to go flat versus this kind of nested structure. So that's uh, I'm going to call that not a hard and fast rule, but it's kind of more preference. And that systems are really important so long as they serve you and you don't serve them. All right, so this is one of those cases where I'll balance between the two. Okay, so, yeah. And a, a quick follow-up, if I may. Um, so like in this case, if I have, if I have like a class that has a So in our case, we actually have a hardware abstraction there for our instruments, and we follow that exact model. We'll have a top-level directory named instruments, a subdirectory sub named DMMs, and then subdirectories for each vendor's specific or concrete implementation. Good question. <coughs> All right, pressing on. Uh, these next slides, it's a summary of what I just said. OK, so now we get into this idea of an export. Um, I stole this terminology straight out of NI. Um, so you have your source, and then you're going to develop a proxy of that source as opposed to linking directly against the source. That proxy could be something like a VI package. So rather than you syncing down the source on disk, your end user will install a VI package. Maybe it's an executable. Maybe it's a DLL. It's a proxy of the source, a representation, a build thing. 
The way it got generated is by following the steps in the build directory. And we'll get to that in just a second. But I'll actually check in what I call important exports into purples. An important export might be something like the, uh, the version of the VI package that was our marker transitioning from alpha to beta, or the VI package that transitioned from beta to final. I want all of that checked in so I have no good spots in case anybody comes to me and says, hey, Chris, your software is busted. I can install an older version and say, well, maybe you yes, asked no. Let me, let me fact check you on that. Make sense? Questions on that? Okay. Am I going too fast, too slow? Uh, if you didn't check in your exports, couldn't you rebuild them from your first build? Sure, so long as you can guarantee that your source hasn't changed since the last build. So the problem is, how do you know what state of source reflects which build? You'd have to do it by, like, the date. Right, so you, all of your, your previously released components that broke, right? But so you're talking about your, like, current most recent. Yeah, so you're still working. No, that's, a, that's an important distinction. So this is for the 1.1 version of my software. Let's say I just added a new feature, and so I check it in, and I want to make a build of that. And then I discover there's a bug in it. So I check in a change and make a new build. It's still 1.1. It's just like 1.10, I don't know, 250. Not that I make that many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I make that many mistakes. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, OK, so one of the systems that I've also stolen from NI uh, is under export for a final build, I'll title the directory F0 or F1, and that corresponds to, hey, this is the first final. Really? <laughs> okay, good, I'm glad you guys got that. <laughs> right? It's the first final until somebody uses it and they discover a critical bug. Then you go back and you rebuild your final and you re-release it. And you do that as many times as it's necessary to call that thing stable, branch, and move on. Now, it's also not uncommon at Serious Logic that We'll, we think that we have the final version, stamp of approval, branch, move on, and somebody's using an old version of our software, and we have to go back and make an edit in the old version, rebuild it, and propagate that change forward into the currently revisioned branch. Oh, a critical fix. A critical fix. That's exactly right. So it's a hot fix. And I've got to make sure that, that hot fix is it's just the, the nature of the game. If I could somehow magically enforce that everybody at Serious Logic stayed on the same version of software that I'm developing, it'd be great. That's not the way this game works. All right, so when you start, if I was going to service all of you all with a different version of Windows, or a version of Windows and a, and a version of Word, you know, some of you might be using Word 2014, some of you might be using Word 2016. And if you, somebody in 2014 is going to pay me $100 million to go make a hotfix, I'm not saying no to that. Right, so I'm going to go and open up the old trunk, rebuild it, and if it's an important enough fix, I'll duplicate that fix in the 2017 version of work. This is just the nature of software release. The consequence of having release versions. And release versions are really important, so I'm still looking at it. So in your subfolder, you would have your <laughs> Precisely. You got it. Nature. So uh, the vast majority of my exports are VI packages. So if you opened up the F0 directory, you'd see VI package name 1.1.0. And that way I check in that VI package so I can always get back to it. Now, you might decide that you want to do that for your alpha builds and beta builds. Go for it. The whole entire point is you're, you're checking in these known good states or these checkpoints or transitionary stages. Whatever you deem is an <coughs> important build. This is the system support. Okay, question. When you do the, the build, uh -huh. the final build, how do you know which version of the source that is? How do you go, do you need to change that, but how do you go back to that particular source? Because the, the version of this uh, export, say VI package 1.9.1.32, is going to be inside of here. So if I have to go rebuild, so my customer had version 1.9.1.32, they found a bug in it, I know to go to 1.9.1, change the source, which is in here somewhere, and then re-export. So that's how I tie what was distributed to the version of the component. 
a good, that's, a, that's a very good I guess, oversight on my part. So you've already decided what the version is before you start developing? Yes, that is a true statement. I have decided what the version is before I start developing. And you even have a document listing what changes you want to do? Yes, so I actually have an entire pro no, no, you're, you're right. Okay, so you know, in my keynote, there's so much I wish I could have said from the keynote stage. Uh, one of the things I said is we tried to build our own test executives and to design and then develop, build and deploy, document and maintain any software is a gigantic pain because then you have to actually document, well, what, what all was changing inside of each build? And what's your plan? When are you gonna introduce a particular feature? Why is that important? Because I have customers that want to know when their feature is going to get in. God, I talk about this so much. Well, <laughs> well, one, of the, one of the presentations I'm considering making is everything a software engineer needs to know that has nothing to do with software development. <laughs> and it's stuff like, how do you manage expectations of your stakeholders? Well, one of the ways that you do that is by putting a timeline in place. And you say, oh, you've asked me for one particular feature. It's a great idea. I look at my resources. We don't have near enough time or enough manpower now but I can do it in two versions, are you okay with that? Then you document how you're gonna get that feature in two versions. So you put in front of a screen one of these days, do that exact thing and post it up. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is why I wanna make a presentation. There's a lot of, we'll say, politicking that really goes on in software development. A lot, and I'm sure you guys know this. Okay, now I'm just gonna breeze through this stuff. Uh, right, so here's where I was saying, you might, oh, well this is the build director, this is important stuff. So under the build directory, I have statically named directories called build spec, stands for build specification, and custom build steps. And so you might have your custom build steps for your NI package, which is a new thing. NI package manager is a parallel distribution technology in, uh, to, to VI package manager. So you might have your VI package manager build steps. Uh, the build specification would include things like yeah, the LabVIEW project. This is where I put my LabVIEW projects. Uh, and the LabVIEW project is going to have the, what are they called? The build, build specifications inside of it. Yeah. Or this is going to be where you have your VI package build spec. Or any INI files to configure your build system uh, for this specific module. When I say INI files, if you come to my Thursday presentation, my entire build system is based on INI files. I'll walk you through it. I'm trying to push through so I give these guys enough time to actually show you the really cool stuff. All right, okay. uh, right so custom build steps, I'll do that. Inside of VI Package Manager, if you guys have never used it, you can specify these custom build actions, like before you actually execute the build, do this thing first. And then after you execute the build, do this other thing. So what are some things that I might want to do before I execute a build? I know. <coughs> How about script block diagrams? Or how about I make sure that all of the uh, uh, what is it, automatic error handling is turned up? So I want to do that. Build the distribution. And then I want to figure out what version of the library I just built. Take that name and embed it in the VI documentation of every VI. So now I can just open up a single VI and know which library and which version of that library it came from. So that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Build version. Depends on if the built version is source or an executable. I distribute source. So a VI package distributes VIs. So I'll actually go into the VIs and change them. Uh, you don't build uh, I build one executable. He's coming with previous That's correct. So um, man, there's so much other developers to use to build that. That's exactly right. So I put, yeah, so my job at Serious Logic is to develop infrastructure that other people can extend to make our final products. So, so what is, if you get a pre-build action, something has happened when you say, build an executable, also, it also works on building zip files, building Correct. source distribution, it's building additional Thank you. The exception to that is they don't give you the pre-post build are you talking about NI packages or NI You're correct. You're correct. So, 
But you've got a pre-install and post-install. Yeah, and I've actually messed with that a whole lot. Those are actually not VIs. Those are command line, command lines, which yeah. don't do install. I came up with a whole entire system that allows me to call the version of LabVIEW I want and execute the VI in that version of LabVIEW from that command line. Pain in my... It's supposed to be better now. Yeah, we'll listen. I, I need to take a look at it. I believe it. I just need to take a look and see. All right, what? Oh, is it? Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, actually, I sat down with R and D over this, and they're like, they've added lots of new stuff. I just haven't had a chance to look at it. So good. That's good enough. All right, hold on just a second. Does anybody see a problem with this? Strike one. LabVIEW version. Strike two. Ah! I moved to a new version of LabVIEW and I'm going to have to go into all of my build specs and update all of this. What a mess! Okay. <laughs> Actually, thank you, JKI, because they let me refer to the custom actions relative to the build spec. So now we talk about this directory structure remaining constant and the relative paths remaining constant. Therefore, once I make one VI package build spec, it services all of my modules. Because the relative location between my pre and my post build steps stays constant because we're following the same directory structure. This is awesome. <laughs> so inside of my prototype, it's not just a directory structure. I can actually have a VI package build spec with these instructions already built into it. And now I'm just throwing my source in the right directory, or I'm throwing my pre and post build steps in the right directory, and it just works. Yes, please. I'm all about instantiation of components. I don't want to, I want to make that new component <coughs> right now. All right. So one of the cool things that you can do in VI Package Manager is specify your source directory and your build output directory. Same problem, right? So again, thank you, JKI, because they let me specify the source and the distribution directory uh, by relative path. If I remember correctly, this is actually a problem, uh, a limitation of LabVIEW today. Uh, I could be wrong on that. You may actually have to go in, uh, I don't know how it works. I know they don't support uh, symbolic paths like user loop and uh, VM loop. Okay, great. So again, this is awesome. I can talk to this versioning procedure. Uh, I have a whole entire, this, is, this literally are the steps that I have on the docs page at Cirrus Logic when we want to make a new version of your component. So if you guys want to take a picture of this, cool. If not, that's totally fine. I won't walk through all of it because I want to turn it over to these guys to show us all the new hotness. But um, here is an example of what our source code control cloud looks like specifically for cloud. And this is what it's going to look like in perpetuity. And from this point forward, I took all of, we have, I don't know, 50, 60, maybe 70 components, reorganized all of that source into this structure. And now one build system can build everything. So that build system is what I'm going to share on Thursday and what I published to Lava yesterday. That's right. OK. What special Oh, so you might have custom tests for your module. So in the same way that you might have like a build system that goes inside of each module and looks for the build steps, you could have uh, a test application, whatever it is, a, a test framework. You want to test all of your software, and it would know to go look in the test directory for that version of that module, because the test should also rev over time as your source revs, right? So that's what's special about test. Also, you don't have regression tests. No, you, you can. So your regression test would live right here. Now, or say that I'm in 1.9, and somebody not that this would ever happen, is going to discover a critical bug that's going to make me rebuild 1.9. Okay, so I'm going to make a change to source, and I want to be able to run that set of tests, the 1.9 version of my test, to make sure I didn't break anything in 1.9. Plus the new test that uh, made sure the bug was fixed. 
Plus, correct, because I'm going to write a new test and stuff it in there to make sure that I catch that bug from this point forward. But those tests might not make any sense in 1.9.1 because I did a refactor. So those tests were all wrong. I had okay, to, so you've got a new set of requirements. That's correct. That's correct. So my tests also need to be able to flex and change as much as my source. I'm also considering something like, I just got through making an auto documentation system, which I will also release. I'm thinking about having a directory for what does it mean to document this version of this module. And so what I've come up with is a way to programmatically interact with Confluence. If you guys, if anybody uses Confluence inside here. So I can programmatically create a page, ask a class, what's your description? Who are your methods? Are they public? Are they private? Give me your uh, screenshot of the VI and dump that into a table and a docs page. So I can make that a part of my own build process. The unique information that I gather for each module could be stored inside of the, I'm making this up now, the docs section. So literally everything that is unique, that is specific to this version of that component goes under that number. It's all grouped together. And that entire set of information revs when I branch. Because you might want to do something different for the next version of your software. This lets you do so. This structure lets you do that revving. Make sense? Any questions? Because I'm done now. Oh. So, sorry. so yeah, it sorry. sounds like, uh, I mean, you gave the example that you would refactor your code so maybe you don't need to test. But if you do still need to test, it seems like this is going to involve quite a bit of copy and pasting and then opening a project and re-adding a new file. And no, so, so when I branch, all of those tests come along. Oh, but so if you already started 1.9.1, then you go back and fix 1.9. Sure. And then you want to add a new test to cover the bugs that you fixed in 1.9. If it makes sense, I might actually, well, it depends on, well, that's, a, that's a very nuanced question. I, maybe it was a big fix, maybe it was a small fix. Well, then that means the change to the test could be big or small. Oh, okay. So, well, I mean, if you add a new test to cover this, and then you decide you still want to cover that test case in 1.9.1, mm -hmm. you have to then copy it into your new set of thoughts as well, right? Correct. I copy that new VI or that new test into the parallel structure, right. but there should be no relinking necessary. So if you fix a test, you've got to fix it in two places. That's correct. There's, there's no way around that. This is the nature of releasing software, because once it's out in the wild, it's out. You can't just say, well, if you want the bug fix, just up there. Well, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I can understand what you're saying, so I'm putting an app on one. Sure. What's yeah, the I'd still like to run the only the current test suite. Ah, except that the current test suite might not make sense with the old version of the software. If you're using requirements gateway, it's just going to say you don't need to do that one because it doesn't cover requirements. How many people use requirements gateway? I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's just, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, that's all I have to say. Unless there's any other questions, I will turn it over to Anand to present. No? I have no idea. Wait, so it's... <laughs> guys, you have no idea... You have no idea how much I'm going to drink tonight. <laughs> okay, so I can't wait to do uh, Wait, it's save time by building... No. <coughs> yeah, so it's, it's the CI track on Thursday at like 2.15. 145, what's its name? Yeah, but what's the name of the... Save time by building your source with build abstraction layers. Yes, save time by building your source with build abstraction layers. What I what I mean by a build abstraction guy... About, just made that up. By about. So, Show up on Thursday to find out. Here, here's, a, I'll just, here, whet your appetite. So we already talked about the concept of an export. What are the different kinds of exports that I mentioned? The I packages, executables, DLLs, whatever. Imagine that you have a parent class called export, and then you'd inherit from it for specifically a DI package. That's a build abstraction. So what I'm handing out to the community is the generic way in which you can build a VI package and an NI package. What I haven't built yet are executables, DLLs, source distributions, all that other stuff. Those are just in the, no, I've got so much I want to share with you guys. We'll pick it up there on Thursday. <laughs> 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 right, thanks, everybody.
All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, so Samina and I would like to cover some differences in LabVIEW and NXG that might uh, influence how you choose to do file management in LabVIEW and NXG. So first off, I wanted to, I'm not used to a map. Uh, uh, so first off, with the LabVIEW and NXG IDE, of course, the editor is different. That's baseline. That's not what this session is about. The is the same. But I did want to highlight one thing pertaining to file management, which over here is the project. So projects are going to be essential in LabVIEW and NXG, and the files pane is going to be uh, docked within the editor here, so that you can uh, use it to see your files, and that's going to directly reflect how your files are organized on disk. So that's one key difference to start out with. Right. Uh, so it's a new editor, but the same compiler, and G language programming, that's all going to be your standard template. All right. So some of the changes also are going to be in the file extension. So if you're working with source code control, you'll need to um, you know, go into the uh, source code control editor, look at, hey, if you're using .gvi, maybe look at the uh, NI compare tool for doing graphical diff, for example. Uh, also for controls and the LabVIEW classes, those are um, into one .g type uh, for uh, looking at uh, custom data, which if then you add in uh, encapsulation and inheritance, it is considered a class. So we have other sessions that will go into detail on that. I just want to talk about the file types for today. And then one key change is that there's no longer this separate thing called the build specification, which is part of your project, but the libraries and applications themselves contain the info about how they're built. So within uh, Levy and XG, there's uh, two file types here, a .gcomp, which today is your source libraries and applications, which contain the information about how it's going to be built, what my version number is, as well as giving you the ability to uh, do custom namespacing. So you no longer have to have the name of the library in itself in a PPL, for example. You can create what the namespacing is within your source library um, or built applications. And then if you take it one step further, after you have your built executable and you want to put something in a package for a broader distribution using an iPackage manager, uh, we have a .lb disk uh, for building distributions. Another key change is source files are no longer binary blobs. If you open up uh, your GBI in a notepad++, plus plus, for example, it's XML. Now, there is a key caveat on this. Today, the source model is not that you can look through the XML and see exactly like, oh, I moved this wire here, or I'm using this exact BI. So it's not necessarily all human readable yet, uh, but that is one area where we're looking for your feedback or interested in hearing how you might want to use uh, the fact that it's no longer binary. All right, so following the same branching model that Chris talked about, so of course there's you know, <coughs> also the mainline approach, but we'll be following the same branching model. Uh, Samina's going to show a demo here in a second using uh, Tortoise SVN instead of Perforce. I uh, wanted to give a quick uh, shout out to Viewpoint, who uh, today has the LabVIEW SVN toolkit. They also uh, put in the work and today have a uh, beta release of uh, LabVIEW NXG SVN uh, toolkit as well, which is open source and on uh, GitHub. I encourage you guys to check out and we'll uh, share the link with you at the end of the presentation to check that out too. Um, so within this demo, we'll be talking about uh, you know just showing where you would put your source, as well as creating exports, in this case, uh, libraries, applications, packages. So one key thing uh, also in NXG is within your um, project folder, you'll see a cache or dot cache. That's just something, um, or that, those cache files help you when you open your code on your desktop to uh, run more performance, but that's going to be changing every time you're going through and editing code. So we don't recommend that you check that in the source code control, uh, as well as there's going to be a project builds folder. So while you're doing your development and uh, you know going through and building an application, right now the default place for that builds folder is within that same project directory. So for, de for development that's fine, but you don't want to check that in until you have your final build, as Chris talked about. And at that point you can um, go ahead and you know, copy that file into source code control. <laughs> right, yes. There's only very unique cases where I've talked to people that actually, you know, check binaries into source code control, but it's not, not standard practice. Okay, uh, so why do you need a project? What's the, the buzz about uh, using a project within LabVIEW and Exchange? So one key thing, as Chris talked about with Christina Rogers' presentation on cross-linking, is today the VI knows all the information about its dependencies. That is no longer the case. The project does the namespace resolution, and is where you, your VI will check with the project, hey, what do I need to open? And it will gather it from that approach. So if you are moving one of the sub-VIs on disk, 
the VI, the, the main VI isn't going to freak out. It's just going to ask the project, okay, what's the new location where I need to load this from? And we'll go ahead and gather it. So we're looking to um, help uh, you know, diffuse some of the issues, especially with novice programmers uh, with uh, running into cross-linking and the infinite loop of seemingly going through the resolve window. Uh, so, uh, also, if you move a subset of VIs within a library, again, um, the caller VIs don't need to be updated uh, as long as that namespace, namespace is key, as long as the namespace doesn't change. But at any point, whether you're moving files on disk or within your labbing pro lab project, it should still be an intentional practice. You don't just necessarily want to move files really well. My question about the namespace, usually if you leave the queue open, so has the memory of where the VI was loaded. Is that also changed from the next gen if you open the file, it reloads the file? So does uh, it still get the file out of memory? Uh, so, so one example could be you can have two files with the same, same name, name in memory, but they can be within different namespaces. So I have library one, uh, you know, open.vi, and library two, open.vi. Because they have unique namespacing, it's okay. Yeah, but the whole the QPR version, Right. So in this case, it's going to ask the project specifically. I have a dependency on you know this open.vi. It's going to ask where I need to pull that from. It's going to get it from different names. The way Lavi and XG identifies the VI is by its qualified name, which is equal to your namespace and then the VI name. So that's the difference. Even though you have two VIs open in memory, because their na qualified name is different. It won't return. It won't result in cross-linking. We're gonna jump into the demo because we only got two minutes left. We'll stay afterwards for questions. This is mostly just to show what it would, what your experience would be like. Uh, would be like yes, um, if you were using NXG the way course recommended. Uh, with your source control provider setup. So I do already have a project set up with uh, Tortoise SVN. I have it checked out. I have the viewpoint toolkit installed so you can see you see that it's already checked out. This is a simple operator interface we built for a sequencer. Um, this is the application that we built for this. There is a main BI. I realize that the resolution is a weird. Sorry about that. But you can see this main VI is not broken right now. It's fine, everything works. The way you would go about building your first version is this is your application, the .gcom file that provides the namespace that Deb talk about. This is where you specified all the details. And you would click on build. And this resulted in the build completing. This is your build queue that's telling you that your build was successful. And you can locate the directory by that. Now, currently, as I've talked about, the output directory is within your LabVIEW project. So for development, that's really good because you have one workspace that's set and you know that you're within that. But when you are about to check it into source code control, you want to copy that, the one that you want to export, into a location like first recommended. We are looking for feedback. If you are, uh, if you think like providing relative space, relative paths over here is something that is important. All right, I see a lot of nods, yeah. so noted. <laughs> um, that is something we can put in our mind. Um Now, the point about namespaces was, say I wanted to create, I, I wanted to refactor my code, and I realized a few of these VIs I'm using in a lot of places, so I want to create a library out of that. What I would do is. I would create a new library, and let's say support tasks. But I would provide the namespace to be exactly the same as I was doing before with the application. And uh, this does create a folder, as Deb talked about. This structure actually reflects your folder, uh, directory structure. So it created a folder behind the scenes for you. Now I keep. Not right now. Not right now. 
I can talk about that more, but I would like to know exactly like what use cases we're missing to serve for that. Which I know we have. I've, I've read threads on it. I'm not really. So this is how I drag these four VIs from the application into the library. It said, do you want to move all the dependencies and update the references? So it did all of that for me uh, behind the scenes. And I know because I've done this before, I know there's one more VI. I'm going to do that interest of time. Um, and you can see the main VI is still not broken. Even though the VI is moved into a library, the project knew, because the namespace is exactly the same, the project knew that it was supposed to get those VIs from that namespace. So we're still able to resolve that. Um, yes, you can change that namespace. You would have to go back and update your VIs to all the right namespaces. So if I change the namespace, how do I it? If you change the namespace, you still need to update your project, and that means your VIs to know exactly which VI do you want. It won't automatically do that for you because we don't want to do magic behind the scenes. That would confuse people, um, which, like in this case specifically, if you're doing a big refactor, say we changed a bunch of your VIs automatically to reflect the namespace, namespace that's how you can run into like cross the issues and stuff. Um, but it does update. Like right now, it updated all your VIs to use that new. Yeah, it does. Um, and then this is the distribution document, which I'm not going to go into it, but this is where you would create the package. You would specify all your information and you would build this distribution to create a package or an package or a package based install. Um, and quickly, just want to show you that we can locate the <coughs> folder on this and see that we create a new folder with all this stuff. That we yes. Yes. Say that again? If to the source code control itself? Yeah. Well, so that's why I initially said when you do move, you want to be intentional about it. There are times, though, that you would want to move it. That's a source code control uh, limitation. But when you do move, um, you do. Like, yes, you you will see when I when I did this, you would see a delete and add. Like, you'll see that something got deleted from here and it got added to this folder. Yeah. Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's different sorts of controls behave differently. I do want to say that. So this is like we're demoing in SVN. I know there are different workflows for other files like distributed versus centralized. <laughs> I don't think changing, so we gotta leave, so we can talk more about this. Changing folders does not change namespacing. So if you just move the whole library into a folder within your project space, it's not gonna break the project. But if you do add it to a new application or a library and change the namespacing. All right, thanks everyone.